Welcome to the 2021 Sunstone Symposium session on Uphill Climb, how three students challenged the administration and turned BYU's vocal point into the most popular thing on campus. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, as, you, many of you, as you have heard many times by now, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help to build a community where all paths are given space to better understood, to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and by subscribing at sunstone.org. In the fall of 1991, <clears throat> three students at BYU set out to bring to campus something that already had been long established at many of the East Coast Ivy League schools, but was missing at their school, a student-run, student-directed a cappella ensemble. What began with run-ins with the administration eventually emerged as one of the most popular things on campus and now enjoys the full support of the university and the church. Former directors and alumni dish on the way the origins of the group, the challenges with middle management, and how the group ultimately found their way to acceptance at the institution. We hope we'll have time for questions at the end. And I will now give the floor to our presenters with welcome to this session. Yeah! Yeah! That's our guy back there. That's our guy. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Um, we, we're going to make this as conversational as we can. Um, I uh, read a tweet this morning that's topical academic conference, we're going to meet in person this year. Delta variant, uh, more of a comment than a question. <laughs> um, so I'm sure this has been interesting, Lindsay, and everyone to try to hybridize this thing. Um, but we're happy to have you here and you online. We just want to tell a few stories. The arc of what we um, kind of the the arc of this story kind of goes like this. Um, it is part of our divine nature to create. It's a really special thing to create. And we all feel it. And we want to do it. And it's also scary. <laughs> and it's hard. Um, and um, it's easier when you're younger gets beat out of you when you get older. Um, institutions um, are sometimes set up to kind of conformize, um, standardize, and it, it's not conducive to creativity. So we're going to tell a story of like what we tried to do, um, kind of the idea that we got, um, what, hap you know, what happened when that started to take off inside of BYU. Um, and some of the kind of standardizing and normalizing that was um, started to emerge. And then we're going to tell a story about how uh, we got canceled, and then how we got uh, uh, pulled back in, and then what, what uh, Vocal Point's done since. So um, Bob and I were, um, met each other in Oklahoma, where we spent one year at the same high school singing in the same choir. Bob's family moved around a lot. My family stayed put. So he came for one year and then left. <laughs> um, and then after our um, missions, we were uh, roommates at BYU. And we had sung together in choir at Stillwater High School. And we decided, and we did stuff. Like we sang um, duets, we pulled together a quartet, Bob had this crazy idea that we could do more than a quartet. And then he said, here, like this. And he handed me, I think, a cassette of Take Six. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> if any of you have heard Take Six, you know how ambitious that is. And I was like, Bob, that's not going to happen. Um, we don't even know how to read music, basically. Um, that's how naive I was. <laughs> 
and Bobby McFerrin had just uh, kind of become a big thing, and so it's like maybe we could do stuff like Bobby McFerrin. And um, anyway, I was not. You were way am more ambitious than I was, or naive. And it I was, was the only time <laughs> when I was more ambitious than you. <laughs> so, um, but we we used singing as a way to um, whatever. Um, it was a cheap date to sing to a couple of young ladies, and then um, <laughs> eat pizza or whatever. Um, so. Um, I took an internship on the East Coast, and I happened to be in Boston uh, during an event called the Head of the Charles, which is a big collegiate regatta in Boston. And I was at um, Faneuil Hall, which is downtown Boston, and there was a group there from University of Rochester, an a cappella group, that was singing just on the street. Um, there were like 12 of them, and they were in like jeans and white t-shirts, and they were singing Billy Joel for the longest time. And the crowd was like 100 people, maybe 150. Like so many people that it was rows back to where the people in the back were having a hard time hearing. And when they were done, laughter, applause, and people throwing money at the feet of this group. Like literally wadding up bills and throwing them over the heads of people in front of them. And uh, so the next day, uh, I called Bob and said, okay, I think we can do this. I think I might have the vision for this. I, I have to interject that the thing that convinced him was the throwing of the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's when he saw the vision. We never actually got money. No, no. We didn't make any money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being, oh, there you go. That's okay. Um, so... While I was on the East Coast, I actually went again to the East Coast, collected a bunch of data. Like there were a whole bunch of uh, collegiate a cappella groups already in kind of circulation, but we didn't have the internet and we didn't, like it wasn't easy to find them. And so I'd have to like, have to figure out who they were and figure out what their phone numbers were of the current members and try to get in touch with one. And, and we got, a, you know, we got some recordings from you know, like Harvard Den and Tonics and the Crocodillos and the Yale with and Poofs and then we had I ran into this guy that I worked with who had sung with his group at Cornell called Cayuga's Waiters. And so we got kind of all this material. And then I also got my grandpa to give me his book of barbershop arrangements. And I thought, worst case, if we can't do any of this fancy stuff, worst case, we can sing four-part arrangements. Um, so we have all this stuff sitting in front of us. And, um, and we're like, OK, this is the year to do it. Um, so let's do it. And you have a flyer there. Um, printed out that we posted all around campus, um, and uh, but we realized probably right about the time we were making that flyer that we had no idea how to run an audition, we had no idea how to tell if someone was any good. We couldn't even play, like, you know, you do the me, 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 and someone's playing on the piano. Um, we couldn't do that. <laughs> um, so scales. like, what? It's called scales. Scales, yeah. <laughs> We couldn't do that. Um, I would, like, and then you have to change key. I could do it in the key of C, maybe, but then you have to change <laughs> keys. Um, that wasn't going to happen. Um, so we're like, who do we know who actually knows what they're doing? And my sister's roommate knew what she was doing. Um, <laughs> she, was, she was a music major and now a graduate student in music. Were you a graduate student already? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A graduate student in music. Uh, piano performance, so she could definitely do this, <laughs> um, and she could probably arrange and read music and transpose and other things too. So we called Jill. Will you help us run these auditions? Um, this is one I interject and said they tried the woo, the same woo tactic on me. If you've been to BYU campus, they stood on the Mazer steps and sang a couple songs. I don't know if there's pizza involved. <laughs> They're like, we need a group like this. Don't you think we should have a group like this? I'm like, yeah, I think so. And then we started doing lots of brainstorming. And it turned out Jill didn't uh, wasn't just classical. <laughs> like she knew all genres of music, um, including jazz. Knew more about jazz than we did. We thought we wanted, you know, Take Six as a jazz group, and we thought we wanted to tend that way a little bit. Jill knew more about jazz than we did. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, we held auditions. Um, Jill ran them, 
We did callbacks. We did everything you're supposed to do. And we got to the point where um, we knew um, that us two, because we grandfathered in, we probably wouldn't have passed the auditions, but we got in because we were in charge, plus five others who were shoe-ins, um, including Todd um, on the front row here, shoe-in. And, but we had, we couldn't make, we wanted to be a double quartet. We wanted to be eight people, because worst case, we can put two on a part and do the barbershop songs, right? Like, if we're not good enough to do the jazz stuff, we'll just do barbershop, two on a part. Well, we couldn't make that choice for the eighth person. We had two candidates. We went to uh, Mac Wilberg, who's the director of Motab now, but at the time, he was director of Men's Chorus. And, uh, we were in Men's Chorus. And we were in Men's Chorus. And we said, hey, Mac, can you help us make this final decision, this person or this person? Um, this person, and he knew them both, you know, this person is a high tenor and this person is a low bass. And he was like, well, do you need a tenor or do you need a bass? And we're like, okay. <laughs> You're being really helpful here, Mac. <laughs> Dr. Wilberg. Um, so we, long story short, we didn't choose and we had nine people. That's how we got to nine. And then basically what that meant is no off-the-shelf arrangements would work, um, which was good because Jill was good enough to arrange and we found people who could rearrange things and it forced us to get creative. Todd was extraordinarily creative there. And this guy named Nathan Lowry was extraordinarily creative, creative, would get into these practices. Wasn't he one of the final two? Two freshmen. Yeah, it and there was were three. Earl, it have been. I Earl, Earl and Earl and maybe Nathan. I, I think it would have been Christian. Could we stop for one second and just talk about how cute we are up there? <laughs> Has anyone noticed? We're Wait. we're adorable. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So it opened just the accident of being nine opened a bunch of creativity. Um, we um. We would, there was nowhere to meet to practice. So we decided, we figured out nobody really needs the classrooms and the HVAC, which is the fine arts building, you know, after eight o'clock. So we'd meet at eight o'clock in a classroom. We'd just kind of squatters rights it. And then um, and we'd do that like, I think about three times a week. And then um, we would, we would try. We were trying to figure out kind of how to get organized. We had a whole brainstorm meeting around names for about 48 hours. The name of the group was not Vocal Point. It was Todd was very unhappy about this 48-hour period. This is how I recall it, Todd. Um, the name of the group was If Rocks Could Sing. That was his idea. Yeah, yeah I not think the Dave Thomas of Wendy's. <laughs> I, I think you were, uh, you were not in favor of that, and you asked us for a revote, and then we came to Vocal Point. You don't remember it that way. Yeah, If Rocks Could Sing became an, an album title, not a group name. Um, so, um, and, and we would often get kicked out of those rooms by the janitors because they had to shut the building down, and we, weren't, um, and we were still practicing. We, we had these really intense kind of, you know, debates about who we wanted to be and what we wanted to do. One of, one of the intense times was when we asked everyone for 20 bucks, which is a lot of money when you're in college. Um, like, why do we need 20 bucks? Why do you need my 20 bucks? Like, I'm giving you all my time. Like, what do you, it's not you giving me time. We have to make photocopies and they cost money. Like, why do you have to make photocopies? Because that's how we learn our music. Well, why would it cost $20 to do, well, also we got to make flyers. Because we were 100% guerrilla marketing all the way. Um, so these flyers would show up. Uh, we were not like this one here, but we would make, we would make them about kind of, we, we had to get people to come to our concert. Nobody knew uh, us. So they would show up on handrails, on bulletin boards. We'd make these little quarter sheet flyers and hand them out at the beginning of each class. They'd be on the inside of the bathroom stall doors. There would be anywhere that we thought we could get someone's attention, even for 15 minutes, it was worth to us like the five cent um, that we had to spend on the photocopy. 
and the first concert that we held was free, and it was uh, in the Mazer Building Auditorium. And we, the reason we picked that is because you could it, book it. it has two, because we could book it for one, yeah. <laughs> 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 because we had an in with the honors department. Yeah. But it had two levels, two seating levels, which means it looked pretty awesome, but it only seated like 150 people. And if we, if we didn't have more than, if we had like 40 people, we could spread them out in the bottom and ignore the top, and it would still look okay. That was like our reasoning. Like, it wouldn't be embarrassing. Um, so we were in the, um, you want to tell this part, Bob? You're good at telling this part. Which, which thing? We're just warming, we're warming up, we're getting ready. Um. Utah, I, I, Okay. Yeah, um, no, you go. Okay, <laughs> fill in. So Jill, you remember this. We're, so we're downstairs in, you know, the green room, which was <laughs> just like the student lounge. And, um, and we're kind of warming up. We're getting, we're actually pretty nervous. Like, my heart is racing. We've said a prayer, like we don't know if anyone's gonna show. We build this as a big thing. We've literally done thousands of flyers and it's, you know, and we're just hoping it's not gonna be embarrassing. And somebody comes in well, and says, um, guys, uh, it's full. We're like, okay, then send them to the balcony. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. We're so excited. He's like, no, 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 the balcony's full. We're like, what? I wish you could have seen the look on their faces. It was, we were gobsmacked. I mean, that's the only word I can think of. It was, what? And we were like, okay, have them sit in the, then have them stand up and behind. They already are. Have them sit in the aisles. They already are. Um, we're like, okay, so now we're breaking fire code. Um, have them stand outside the doors. So like, literally, as many people as we can cram in are there. So now our hearts are like really racing. Like, what the heck? And, um, and we go up and perform, and we have a ton of fun, and it's pretty, you know, we're a little bit irreverent, whatever we're doing. We, I think this is, we do a song that has drums in it, and by drums I mean That was like the whole thing. Um, but, um, but people liked it, like it was awesome. And standing ovation, and like encore. And, um, and it felt cool because like you had two levels and everyone was full and the aisles were full. So we thought we were onto something. And um, the, uh, I'm probably going too long. I'm gonna speed this up a little. Um, <laughs> um, so it turned out we couldn't keep doing what we were doing. We couldn't keep cheating on trying to get a room. We couldn't keep cheating on booking. Like we booked this as an honor student council event. Um, and, um, and so we were trying to figure out how could we get how could we become official? We looked into becoming a club, uh, but if you were a club, you um, weren't in charge of your own finances, and you had to have a faculty advisor. Had to have a faculty advisor. So we we kind of snuck in with Honor Student Council, and we said, "Can you open an account in our name? Can we be like an Honor Student Council ad?" like adjunct organization, and they said, yeah, we can. So that way you can book rooms, that way you can um, collect money for tickets. Um, so we did that. And then that summer, we, um, we decided we we're, we're gonna stay in Provo, and we we're going to book ourselves beyond 84604. Like, we're gonna see if we can find, like, people to hire us to go do things. We had had another concert, it was also, a sellout, meaning like free tickets, but all seats full. Um, and so we got like a business manager, which is Bob's brother, and we, we like <laughs> made up these uh, like this press kit, and like we tried to bill ourselves. And I think Jill helped us get booked at the Nampa Civic Center in Nampa, Idaho. Um, is that picture up there right now? With um, with them. with the McKees. With the McKees, which is a family singing blue, sensation, like a bluegrass, bluegrass, family, bluegrass sensation, family. yes, um, and <laughs> like, so this is awesome. We're on like the arts circuit. <laughs> um, well, we we got called into the principal's office. So I was I was at Aspen Grove family camp with my family. Bob, I check in with Bob. 
who's in Provo at our apartment, like, hey, anything, you know, how's it going? Anything we need to know? He's like, oh, yeah, we just got called by performing arts management. What's that? It's BYU. They want to talk to us. Why? Uh, I don't know, but they want to know, can we come in today? I'm like, oh, geez. This, I remember getting called into the principal's office. That is not good. Um, so I come down out of Provo Canyon, Bob and I go in and we meet with the head of performing arts management and he says, and he's, I don't think he has a copy of the flyer, but he tells us exactly what the flyer says and he's like, you cannot do this. We had debated the design of this flyer and we had said to the guy who designed it, Lowell, one of our group members, don't say that we're BYU group because we're not. Say nine men from BYU. So that's what he had put on the flyer, and I made it very clear to Ed that we didn't say we were a BYU group, we said we were nine men from BYU. He's like, yeah, you can't say that. I'm like, we didn't use the logo. He's like, you can't say that. I'm like, we're from BYU. He's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, it's not gonna work. Um, like, you can't do that again. And then he starts to give us, instruct us on what it means to be able to use the BYU name and that's a whole process and you know you'd have to get approved and you'd have to get, you know go through all these um, hoops and we said surprisingly to him by the way I was not on my best behavior I came down in like ripped jeans and like a bandana like um, and a, like a t-shirt and uh, I would he was not taking us seriously but we said um, okay so how do we do that and we kind of called his bluff, and he's like, well, it's a whole thing, and you have to go talk to um, this guy, Roy Brinkerhoff, and then he'd have to get, show you the rest of the ropes, and we're like, great, what's his number? <laughs> so um, so we, uh, we, long story short, we went to Roy. He told us what we would have to do. He said there's this category of a regional performing group that gets to perform only within like 20 miles of Provo, and then there's a category of like a national performing group, and then there's an international performing group. We're like, yeah, we want that one. <laughs> um, he's like, no, you would be lucky to get a regional, and if you're regional, you can only perform X number of times in a semester, and you can only uh, miss Y number of days of school, which is like two, I think. And um, 50 mile. It was a 50 mile? It was a 50 mile. It, it eventually was a 200 mile radius of from Provo. 200 miles. We okay. could go to St. George. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And perform. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, and he's like, but it's a whole thing. And we're like, well, we want to do it. I forgot the whole Helen Miller story. Dang it. Um, so we had a meeting with both of those guys from performing arts management, Hal Miller, who was the Dean of Honors, who had been our original sponsor, um, and the head of the music department, Newell Daly and Jill and Bob and me. And they said, and they laid it out for us. Um, at the time, there was a very irreverent, student-run newspaper called the Student Review. And, um, and it was free, it was funded by advertising. And Hal Miller said, look, you guys have got to decide if you want to be the Student Review, which was this off-campus newspaper, or the Daily Universe, which is the on-campus newspaper. It's like Student Review has awesome editorial, and also it has bad editorial. Um, the Daily Universe is middle of the road every day, all day, seven days a week. Um, Student Review is probably going to offend someone at some point. The advertisers are probably going to disappear, and it's probably going to disappear. Um, Daily Universe will never disappear because um, it's highly correlated and it's part of the institution. Uh, student Review is, is about the people who are making it happen. The Daily Universe is about the institution. So which do you want to be? We didn't actually know. We went took it back to the group and we put it to the group. Which do we want to be? Like, do we want to have no restrictions on our travel and we can't use the BYU name but we can do anything we want and we can record and we can sell and we can do whatever? Or do we want to be a approved BYU group, and we voted, and I think it was fairly unanimous by the time we were done that we wanted to be, we wanted this to be a tradition at BYU. Like, it wasn't about us. It, it was, was about one of the things we talked about, the three of us, as we were getting ready, as we were preparing to start it, 
was that we wanted to have something like they had at Harvard and Yale, where these were groups that had been long established, and that when people graduated, they graduated, and then those slots were filled by other you know, students, and then it just sort of kept going, and we decided that that's what we wanted to create at BYU. And we knew we only had a certain amount of time to do it. If we could somehow get slotted into an official kind of spot, then we would have a chance of perpetuating. We also knew that it needed money, and we didn't really know how to solve that problem. But we did decide we wanted to try to go for this idea that we would get approved as a regional performing group. And before, so we did this for three years, Bob and Jill and I, before we all had to move on. And um, um, you did it for two years, right? Two, yeah. Two years, yeah. Two, so, more, two and a half or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was the amount of time that we had to kind of establish um, the brand, the identity, the um, try to get approved, <laughs> um, and we were. We were, we were approved. And so in our final year, we actually got to perform officially in the Dion Concert Hall, um, which is 1,200 seats, way bigger than the Mazer Auditorium. And because we were still, even though we were approved, we were still breaking a few rules with flyers and other things, um, we we were really guerrilla marketing the heck out of this. We were selling those concerts out, selling out the 1,200 seats. Can I tell the Bannister story real quick? Please tell the Bannister There's, story. So we, we were always putting, you had to get flyers approved on campus. You had to take them to some office, and they had to put a stamp on them, and that's the only way they could be on a bulletin board. And we were always putting flyers up, and they were always getting pulled down. We were always putting them up again. We just did that all the time. Well, Dave and I lived south of campus, if you know campus, uh, you, know the, you know where the brick oven is down there, and there's that big, long walkway that goes up where people ride their bikes up, and you walk, and there's a banister that goes all the way up that separates the two, the up lane and the down lane. So we would always walk to school together in the morning, so we had made little quarter sheet fires for the show, and we, we left early, and we, as we walked up that hill, we taped... Uh, little quarter sheet flyers all the way up that giant banister. I mean, probably 150, 200 little teeny flyers on both sides so that when students were walking to and from class that day, they would be there and they could just grab one and, and hooray, we were promoting our show. A couple days later, we get another call and there were some very mad maintenance people because apparently they had just painted that banister like the day prior and every time a student would say oh vocal point and they pulled the flyer off it pulled paint off so there were these little patches of missing paint all the way up the banister and we were just like oh boy that's too we promise we'll never do it again <laughs> so at this point we hand it off to the next generation paul's going to tell the uh kind of the awkward teenage year part of this story. Yeah, we, <clears throat> that calling into the principal's office got old pretty fast. We, we decided to be a little more proactive with administration. There was a new president coming in and we thought, oh, what, what we'll do is we'll go and sing for every secretary because I convinced people that secretaries run the world. So we'll, we sang for every administrative secretary and then the president. We didn't have appointments to any of these. We would just walk in and say, can we sing you a song? And almost everyone said yes. And other people heard it would come out in the hall. We said, we're going to come see you in a minute. And so we eventually got in. Uh, we didn't have an appointment, so they said the president couldn't see us. But we sang so many songs that he wound up coming out and listening to us. We wound up giving everyone free concert tickets. We who tried to the, be. Who was the president at this point? So at first, it was um, uh, Lee. Rex Lee. Rex Lee. And uh, then came in, uh, who was it next? Samuels? Yeah, Samuelson. And he was the first one to actually use the concert tickets and come and see us. And they were middle, center, the best seats in the house, we felt like. Row seven, our sound guy said, this, these are the perfect seats, just a little bit over, you know. And so we, and we'd look out at one concert and they weren't filled, another concert they weren't filled. And so we were trying to do something proactive rather than getting called in all the time. We thought, well, we'll make ourselves known. We also volunteered that any um, function that the president had, we would come for free. By this time, 
we were already an institution uh, at BYU, but we were still on that kind of, people looked at us like the red-headed stepchild, you know. So the president, uh, President Lee took us up on it, said, all right, well, come and do this function. There happened to be a bunch of general authorities in the 70s, apostles in the 70s, and it went over really well, and he was like, wow, that, that was pretty good. And then we did the same for Samuelson, and we started getting a little more attention than that. And uh, then um, in the year after I got there, the School of Fine Arts that had a department of music, that, that became, they became different schools in there, so they re-became the School of Music with their own dean there. And BYU uh, Vocal Point didn't have uh, very many music majors. In fact, during my year, uh, first year, we had none. Um, and so that was kind of a sticking point with the music faculty. And they started saying that we are going to, uh, if with this new school of music, they had a very classical kind of approach to what they wanted. And they decided that vocal point didn't, didn't fit that, didn't need to be a part of that, and we were going to, oh yeah, uh, we were holding up the administration. But, um, so they decided that we, we shouldn't be a part of BYU anymore. And we were the only self-funded group. So we weren't costing the department a dime. We had all the money that, that these guys had started putting in, that they raised in concert, went back to BYU, including hiring a quarter-time faculty member and paying his benefits. He had been a half-time employee uh, in sound and, and, uh, and audio technology named Jim Anglesey, amazing, amazing man. And uh, so a quarter of his salary plus all of his benefits, now that he was three-quarter time, came out of the money we earned at BYU. No one from the group got the money. But um, so when this started, he was nervous that, you know, he couldn't go talk to the dean. And so I, uh, luckily, um, was not a student at BYU. I taught in the English department as a member of the faculty. I'd heard vocal point. I'd been in another a cappella group. I'd loved a cappella my whole life. And when they had auditions, I said, oh, I'm going to try out for that. And luckily, my bishop had been the first faculty member allowed in a student group. So he had done all the paperwork and all the other stuff, red tape through BYU administration. So I just followed his lead. I said, hey, I want to join the student group. What do I have to do? And he helped me. So because Jim didn't want to approach the faculty or dean, I made an appointment as a faculty member, and I walked in and, and uh, sat down and talked to Dean Randall, and he said, oh, I don't want to talk with any students. And I said, okay, I won't invite any. And he looked at me and he said, what? Because I had a very baby face 20 years ago or whatever, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, we haven't been around 40 years. And he said, excuse me? Face, right? Yeah, there's my baby face. And I said, he said, excuse me? I said, oh. Oh, I'm not a student. I'm faculty. And he said, excuse me? And so I don't know how the Lord gave me that to say, but I was very grateful because uh, snappy comebacks aren't always my thing. It takes me, you know, like a day later to come back with a good comeback. <laughs> but uh, we wound up having a talk, and we talked for about two hours. And I said, I want you to understand things about Vocal Point that you may not know. And I asked him his perceptions of the group, and we talked for a long time. Uh, and I was really blessed uh, that day. Um, we had a couple of other things happen at the same time, but they decided after, uh, he had no idea we were self-funded. I said, we cost you nothing. We, we don't take any of your time. We don't take any of your money. We, don't take, we do everything ourselves. Uh, you lend us Jim Anglesey, but we pay for his time with us. He doesn't take any time away from that. In fact, it augments what he's doing for your stuff because now he has more to work with. And, things like that. By the time we were done, he said, I'm going to really consider this. Um, the other problem we really faced was a Mormon culture kind of uh, uh, impediments. We did, uh, Bob and Dave uh, created another group called Extempo, uh, which was a professional group after they left BYU. And they had this great song that we asked to borrow. It was the Joseph Smith story sung as a gospel tune, like good southern gospel and uh bob said okay you can do this song but only in certain conditions you know you can't you know you've got to be really circumspect how you 
how you do this. And we said, oh, okay. And we got an invitation for Christmas, the Deseret Mutual uh, uh, Society or Deseret Mutual Administrative <laughs> Group. And the prophet, six members of the Quorum of the Twelve, a bunch of 70, and then all the DMBA board were going to be there. And we thought, oh, not only are we going to do the Christmas song, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, we're also going to do this great Joseph Smith song, which they will probably just love. I mean, this seems like the perfect time to do that. Well, we did Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, and nobody in the room laughed or smiled until President Hinckley did. And we thought, oh, okay, that's how this show's going to work. <laughs> and it was, you know, we did Oh Come All You Faith. We did a whole bunch of other cool things. Uh, we did um, uh, the Lion King uh, Circle of Life. We called that the African Christmas song. But um, we did this Joseph Smith song toward the end where we normally do a hymn. And uh, we loved it. it it got applause and everything, but one member of the Quorum of the Twelve did not like it and noised it around, and we heard about it. Hold on, this is Sunstone, Sun, so you can name these people. You can name them. Elder Haight did not like this song at all and told not only people there, but we got yelled at, called in the principal's office. Jim Anglesey, our faculty director, did. Then we as a group... And we were talk, talked to by the dean of how this was an inappropriate song. How dare a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, you know, hated it, and da, da da And we were thought, oh, it seemed like the room was really great. What happened? Well, President Monson, who was in attendance at that show, heard about it. And he came down specifically and made an appointment with the School of Music dean, Dean Randall, same guy who was considering whether we get axed from the music program, and said, I love Vocal Point. I mean, he came and did that for us because he had heard what happened with Elder Hate. Now, we were lucky that one of the members was dating his granddaughter. <laughs> and now they're married. And they got married. They got married. So that's one reason he heard about it. But, you know, he heard about it that night, too. So he did us a, a favor by coming down and talking because in the Mormon hierarchy, President Monson outranked elder hate at the same time elder packer can, I, and he may not be popular here but he uh, really helped us because he had heard us uh, we did a fireside for him and he requested us for a christmas thing we had another obligation that night and performing act management ed boyer said oh we have so many other groups and he said no i will only work with vocal point they brought the spirit when we i was there like no other group i've ever heard before well, that also got back to the dean at the same time. So we were helped, hurt by one apostle, helped by two others who outranked him. So that, that was a pretty amazing thing. The other thing that helped us the following year was Mac Wilberg uh, had his uh, American Piano Quartet, which was amazing, four pianos and just beautiful. He performed at the Tabernacle New Year's Eve right after we did. So we were on stage they were in the wings waiting and as we came off he said don't go anywhere i want to talk with you and we thought oh now what did we do so we waited through their whole performance on stage and he came out after and he said i had never really heard vocal point since they since they started i really didn't have an idea of what you guys did musically you were so good tonight that i will never ever stand in your way again so that was a big deal for us too because mac held a lot of sway uh, in the School of Music. So those, we were so blessed to have so many things help us where we were you know, literally told we were not going to be a group on campus. We had other issues too. The distance travel was a problem and the money situation, but we always, we always worked around that where the university didn't ever know. Like I used my faculty per diem to help feed the guys because they, they couldn't get any money out of the group we used the album sales, which nobody we learned nobody was tracking. So CD sales I, and concert. Skimming off the top. So, yep, we were skimming off the top to, to feed the guys. Not a lot of stuff, but yeah, it'd be literally we were performing. We were every day rehearsing for two hours, so five days a week, and then sometimes six. And then we'd have uh, about, it was about 20 hours a week that we were doing vocal point, because we would have at least two shows a week. And... Um, 
all booked through Pam, but then you'd finish by the time you broke down and everything. It was sometimes 10, 11, 12, and we hadn't eaten since four or something. And so guys were hungry, and I'm like, I'm Italian, I gotta feed people, you know? And so, so I, they called me Father Guido after a while, but I learned how to get the money right just so we could feed everybody, I, which I thought was the minimum we should do. It eventually got back to Ben Fales in, uh, when he was taking over the record label and stuff, because he started tracking money. And luckily, I just became friends with Ben, and, just, and he would just be like, Paul, you can't do this. And I'm like, oh, uh, sorry. I did use my per diem, though. <laughs> It's a, I want to just point out that what Paul's been talking about is, is um, did, I don't know if he, it was clear, but I'm going to emphasize it, that the, the man who was in charge of the School of Music at the time had just sort of unilaterally decided that Vocal Point didn't have a place, and he had come in and said, this is going to be your last year, yep. and, uh, and that's it. And, um, and so all the stories that Paul's been telling you have been, what? Yeah, what year? 97. No, sorry, 96. So the group has only been around for like five years, and now there's a guy who just doesn't like us and, and just decided we didn't need to be there. And Paul sort of took the reins, and because he was in, on faculty, he had access that nobody else in the group had. So it was fortuitous, it was a blessing, and he just started taking meetings with everybody, and then, you know, the people in power that liked the group were like, no, 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 you can't cut this group yeah, you know Newell and a bunch of other yeah and by the and so by the end of that school year uh, i like to say paul had saved vocal point oh, that's nice we come on for paul we did a lot of other things the group really came together and we went and sang again for the faculty we knew were on our side and and uh, i remember one faculty meeting where jim told us that everybody actually took a vote i think we won by a couple of votes only and it was because we went around and talked and we finally got the dean on our side and and it also see part of it they were upset because we were the most requested group on campus at by this point from performing arts management and we performed more than any other group but we weren't music majors so they didn't that didn't fit their idea of what should be the group didn't represent their mission they yeah felt, exactly right? uh -huh. Until, until we explained how we did, and we felt like that was it. 15 minutes. We're right on time. 15 minutes. What, uh, did, did you have more on your guys' end, you and Jill? Are you gonna sing for us? Jill is. We, 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 <laughs> yeah. we wish. No, I mean, I guess, really, looking back at those, at those first, eight, nine years, there were so many things that happened that just happened to line up. Um, lots of coincidences and 2020 hindsight very much prove that they weren't coincidences. I mean, Bob and Dave approached me when I had my most free time ever as a grad student. And I probably spent as much time working with the group as I did putting together my research project. Um, we got away with a lot because they assumed, oh, Jill's just doing this for grad school. Or, yeah, I mean, I had, I had professors ask me, and they're like, what's this thing? I'm like, oh, you know, my, my, the professor I was working with was a little bit of a rebel in the music department, and they just assumed, oh, it's just one of Rosalie's students. Let her do her thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, and Paul's listed a lot of little We've had points. hundreds of those hundreds over of things, the years. Exactly. And, and I think, I, I guess I realized this year, um, somebody in my, in my close circle in Chicago figured out I was, I was a part of this group. And I, she asked me to come speak to her youth group. And for the first time ever, I thought, oh, I never went on a mission. I gave the mission papers to my neighbor. She went to Finland. I went to Vocal Point. I was like, I was there for two years, and I realized, wait, the two years that I spent, to me, was, was my mission. I mean, I, they've done more 
they've done more to promote good and to be creative and to really communicate with people here, which counts more than here, is right here. And, and yeah, just one little miracle after another. I need to point out that um, we've, we've spent the last week putting this thing together. Jill's been a part of the whole thing, but what she's done here is what she did when we were doing our group. She just has sat back and let us do our thing. <laughs> but she was our backbone. Um, okay, we are, we are going to have some time for some questions in a second. I just want to wrap up with a tiny, just a little highlights, because we used to dream. I, it, it's my memory, Todd, that when we dreamed, when we'd have our dream sessions and talking about stuff, that we would talk about touring, and I feel like you're the one who mentioned China. Is that true? We wanted to, that was one of the places we talked about going. Yeah, for sure. Um, in my, just take credit for it, Todd. You knew of it? <laughs> you had heard tell? <laughs> so, I, we, but um, after a lot of run-ins and a lot of hard times, and it was a lot of effort, and it still is, I think, to some degree, um, I wanted to, we wanted to highlight some of the successes. I'm going to just run through those really quick, and then we'll take some questions. So um, if you've ever seen the movie Pitch Perfect, the competition that they were in in that movie is a real competition. It's called the International Championships of Collegiate Acapella. Uh, Paul was in the group when, the, when that started, and he was in one of the very first times that Vocal Point started competing. And then I believe, what year was it? 2006, maybe? Um, yes. Finally made it all the way to the, the thing and won. So for one year, Vocal Point was the best college acapella group on the planet, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and then um, Noteworthy, which was an a all-female group that started several years after Fo Vocal Point did, uh, ended up going and winning the same competition the very next year. So BYU had a back-to-back -back win. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Vocal Point performed at every major venue of the 2002 Winter Olympics. Uh, we had a lot of fun that year. They were on the NBC's The Sing-Off. Maybe some of you saw them on the show. They did quite well. I think they ended up um, getting kicked out around number four. Good story about that if you ask about it. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll ruin those shows for you if you ask us. Um, look at the stats of Vocal Point's YouTube channel. And I need to point out that most of Vocal Point's YouTube presence has been under the current director. His name is McKay Krog, and he's done a great job of uh, sort of expanding Vocal Point's reach this way. Um, one video has 30 million views, pretty incredible. Uh, for a very brief moment in time, BYU allowed them to take a record deal with a major label record, and they had a contract. It, it went south pretty fast. That's not an uncommon story in the music industry. So they, I think they did release a music video or two and maybe some singles. I can't remember if they released the whole album, but we did have that. Uh, let's see. These are some of the people that Vocal Point has uh, not performed on the same stage with, but have performed with. Right? Uh, the guy down in the corner is Ben Rector, in case you don't recognize him. Uh, I left a little shoulder in because I knew this group could handle it with uh, Kristen Chenoweth. You got Gladys Knight. All right. Cute little David Archuleta out there. We have had five of our alumni uh, get into the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, or what's it called now, Claudia? <laughs> I can't. Choir, tabernacle the, the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. Is that what it is? It's Tabcats. Oh, the Tabcats. Anyway, so that's, it's really fun. It's really fun. Some of those are screenshots that, those are photos that I took during conference when I was trying to find my buddies. Let's see. We have, we have quite a few alumni who have gone on to make some or all of their living doing music. And these were not people who were music majors. They, uh, like for example, Ryan Innes, the guy on the bottom left, he was on The Voice. He's been on Songland. Uh, he will tell you that he found his voice in Vocal Point. He was not, he was going to go be a doctor. And he decided to become a full-time musician. He's fantastic. The guy in the upper right, his name is Keith Evans. And he's the most amazing performer. And if you see shows at the Hale Center Theater, he's like almost always in those shows. Let's see, what do we got left? That's it. Scott and Rice and Joe. And, oh, yeah. You know, um, YouTube channel is... And then just finally, before we take some questions, we've got, um, uh, as alumni, we started a, an endowment fund, a scholarship fund. Because as Paul's mentioned, you know, 
your students, you don't get paid to be in this group. It, we established that from the very beginning, that we would never, t people who performed it would never take a dime from it. It would be an experience that we got to do. And so about 20 years ago, we established a fund at BYU. This is how you can donate if you feel so inclined. Uh, the money is, it's an endowment, so it spins off interest. And at this point, we've raised enough money. Do you know how many scholarships we've been able to provide now? Are we up to three. three or four half tuition scholarships for some of the guys? Right now, they go to like people most in need in the group. Uh, so if you feel so inclined, there's that. All right, questions. You had a question. Didn't you raise your hand earlier? David Randall. I don't mind saying it. <laughs> what? He wants, the receipts. he wants the receipts. I can show you receipts, my friend. <laughs> the, the guy before that was a guy named Newell Daly, and he was a big advocate. He was who helped us get in. Because he had been part of Synthesis when Synthesis was just trying to get established, which is the jazz band on campus, which was the devil's music. And it hadn't entered into BYU yet, but, you know, and so there was some resistance against that. So he was sympathetic with our cause, um, Newell Daly. I think we've inducted him into our yeah. Hall of Fame. He let us perform with Synthesis one time just to give us some credibility, too, because they rose in statute there. Todd had a question. Uh, the portly gentleman on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> oh, repeat the questions. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, Mac Wilberg. Yeah, and to, to respect his, his level of musicianship, which might be the highest of anybody any of us have ever played. Um, but he actually came to our second semester concert. Yeah. He did. So, um, you know, oh, that's so right. The fact that he, came, that he heard you perform four years later yeah. and said, I'm 100% advocate, means so much because I remember his face very well. I mean, some from before that, I knew when he was being patient with things. Mm -hmm. And during our second semester concert, he Any other questions? We've got a couple minutes. How many minutes, Claudia? Five. We have five minutes. Now, I will confess, uh, we do have a little video we could show. Kendall's got a question. Oh, Kendall, yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't know, it's more of a comment than a question, I guess. <laughs> um, I was on my mission in 2000, 1999, 2000, and that's where I got introduced to uh, Vocal Point. And it was a very strict, mission we were in uh, indiana we weren't allowed to listen to anything and i know mission presidents are different on what you can listen to and um yeah one of my companions was like here let's listen to this and it was that that fine line that it's like well well they're from byu so this is this is approved from byu not of byu well yeah i mean <laughs> we finally days. we finally made it i mean <laughs> Yeah, and now, and but it was it was one of those things. Oh wow! So um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it it really helped. Just we had some decent music to listen to, <laughs> uh, besides just hymns. Um, it seemed like it, the the tape that we had. I'm trying to remember if it was like mouthing off or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, there were a few that it, it seemed like there was a lot of songs you covered i'm i'm trying to remember like the ratio of like original songs versus what you covered what zero to 100 <laughs> oh, zero original any, you didn't do 100 percent covers very oh. rarely do, did we do original stuff yeah. oh, by we the had way, like Kendall, two by the way paul sung on that album that you listen to. Nice. So now you guys uh, nice. got a little bro hug it out. After. I named that album. We got in trouble for that name mouthing off. That was not a BYU approved. Yeah. Name. Well, I, I think we had a few albums. That's the one I like yeah. the, that I remember. Fatter than ever. Of. They didn't like that one either. I don't remember so. that one. But uh, there were I think there was like some some like some decent rock songs in there too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a good mix. So as a missionary, it felt okay, like we're listening to this, 
because it was the, the spirit of the law, right? It there was okay, Kendall. Yeah. It was okay. So Thank Kendall, you. I appreciate it. We started that. doing original songs during my era, and we did five yeah, that's right. during my three years. And so... Is that Corey writing some Corey of that? did some of that. Jay Hauser did the Aardvark song, which was hilarious. Um, and we had a couple of other guys do stuff. We also started doing song parodies during that time. Uh, almost none of them made them to albums, um, but uh, Corey did two songs. Them. Yeah, but we performed them all the time. Was there a, a Devil Went Down to Georgia? Was that you guys? Yeah. That okay. Was okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was a favorite. That was, <laughs> that was really good. Thanks. We got trouble I, for that one, too. Kendall, I have a feeling you were an outstanding missionary. So Devil Went Down to Georgia is interesting because we would often get in trouble for certain songs because we would change one or two words in the lyrics if there were a swear word or something like that. We got away with that one because I brought them the radio version which said, son of a gun. And so they stopped harassing us about that one. But we had, we got, again, we got called to principal's office a lot for some principal. Everybody wanted to be principal to yell at us. And so the, before we, so you're gonna, are you gonna play this video? Just queuing it up. So before we, before we play this video, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, it is. It is genuinely our feeling that it that we were put on the earth to create, that we were put on the earth to um, to create. We get to create life. We get to create um, beauty. We get to create art, poetry, um, buildings, industries, companies. You know, God called people of every era to um, to create. To, to do things that had never been done, to leave the Garden of Eden, to leave uh, Jerusalem, to uh, found new countries and found new religions and found new um, industries and uh, open your mouth and it will be filled and to act, not be acted upon and to um, uh, open your, you know, and to, to go forth with that person's script. Those are scary, scary things. But when, but when you can put yourself in that spot, um, you know, you give yourself a chance to be part of a process that is amazing. I'm just looking over here at Dave Anderson, also an alum of, uh, of Vocal Point. Um, so just a couple questions to leave you with, and then we'll, I'll let you tee up this video, Bob. One is, you know, what can we do? What can you do? What can I do to bring beauty into the world? Another is, what, how can we help others and not hinder them? either institutionally or individually um, be, to create, help them find their voice and do things and create things that didn't exist before. We're going to, if you, those of you who are watching the stream, we hope you can still watch this, but we're just, our, we're, our time is up, so we're just going to play. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a video we made at our 25th anniversary five years ago. We got as many alumni who could show up. We got a choreographer, a director. We had the current director of Vocal Point did this massive arrangement. You hear this. We basically chose one popular song from every year that Vocal Point has existed and took tiny lines from each of them and created this massive video. It's a one take video, which means we shot it in one take. And we're going to play it for you now, and then afterwards we can, we can mingle. Thank you. As mayor of Provo City, I'm pleased as punch to introduce Hollywood's own Ruby Rogers. And citizenry, we're proud of you for collecting enough green stamps to make it possible for Miss Ruby to select her next leading man right from our own community. I'm your man, Ruby. I'm confident that we can find someone to match up with your sweet spirit. Guys, don't fawn all over her. She hates that. Makes us look podunk. Devin, you're up, son. Go, Devin. Show her what you got. <laughs> you don't know. Oh, oh. You don't know you're beautiful.
Yeah. I think I'll try Des Moines. Thank you all so very much for attending and thank you for the outstanding presentation. And thank all of you for supporting Sunstone. It's been a great conference. So glad you were here. Thanks for coming.